it was in Huberman's time that the official myth of the allegedly authentic glissando-less pre-classical style was born. It's still alive and kicking, this myth, notwithstanding the historical fact that the chin rest was introduced by Louis Spohr, probably because he had a long neck, and that therefore inaudible changes of position were impossible in pre-romantic times, when the left hand alone had to hold the violin. Glissando, or to give it its proper name, Portamento, was ineluctably part and parcel of the violinist's position-changing technique, and hence, like the singer's breath, part and parcel of the composer's own means of expression and articulation. Now, has anybody ever made as intense, exciting, and melodically logical sense in Bach's A minor concerto as Hubermann, with his portamentos in the very places where Bach had intended them, and not therefore merely in the slow movement? Beethoven, the gypsy and the saint had alternated. In the Bach, we get the spiritual gypsy. Bach himself would have been delighted. After all, in his violin music, he was demonstrably a spiritual gypsy himself. And I suggest that this was how he played his own A minor concerto, not the castrated way we nowadays hear it in sundry delusions of authenticity. first and this last movement, the highly charged portamentos threw the centers of melodic gravity compellingly into relief. They did in fact become an essential element of the melodic build-up, and their subtle execution accumulated maximal tension at logically crucial points. In this respect then, and despite the fact that you have only heard an excerpt or two, You've now heard the Bach A minor concerto for the first time. Never before were you given a chance instinctively to perceive with spontaneous crystalline clarity the sheer musical logic of these melodies, which can't be understood without emotional participation, without downright excitement. Such is the nature of music, which is there in order not to be thought about, but in order to be thought and thus felt. The trouble about the lovers of authenticity is that they consider the composer more important than the performer. Not that the performer is more important or that they are equally important. The very comparison is utterly senseless. Music itself only exists in performance, which, if its craft is ruled by its art, provides the tail end of composition. For there is no such thing as an impersonal and hence uncreative performance. If there were, we could replace live performances with authentic electronic simulations. About the composer's intentions, we ought to worry in all conscience. But then let's stop and think which were the performers 
whom that self-same composer admired. When Brahms heard the twelve-year-old Huberman play his own concerto, he broke into tears and promised the boy a rhapsody for violin and orchestra. Brahms died, alas, before he could execute this self-imposed commission. I wonder how Lalo would have reacted to the grown-up Hubermann's interpretation of the Symphonie Espagnole, or rather, I don't. <laughs> Composer or performer, they are no longer distinguishable. Creator and recreator, it is an.